server and an unauthenticated client. I can connect your access point and then start doing an EAP exchange and just put whatever I want in there. If I can find a buffer overflow or an integer error or some kind of uh, vulnerability, I can exploit that without any authentication credentials on the wireless network. So uh, I noticed this the other day, we, uh, we had written the software for free videos, we'll talk about that in a little bit, and they came out with a new version, so I was checking it out the other day, this came out uh, you know, a couple days ago now, and they had some cool things here, you know, okay, you know, added notes, logging, uh, I like this one right here, added the ability to send attributes via raw attribute equals and some random hex value. This is available only in debug builds, it can be used to create invalid packets, use with care. Great! That's awesome, right? So now it's a built-in fuzzer in free radius. So if you're into this kind of thing, you can compile your own free radius server with the debug builds and then just start putting the other configuration files. You don't have to be a coder to do that. Just think of random shit to put in there and then keep sending it to the client. And now you're fuzzing the client that's trying to authenticate to the radius server. So I thought that was pretty neat. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about attacking some meet types, but first I'm going to take a big ass swig of water here. Yeah, man. So uh, what about EAP MD5? So we're going to start with some of the uh, you know easy targets like uh, uh, like emo. Okay. Yeah, you, you XKCD fans laughed lightly. Okay. So uh, EAP MD5 is an early basic authentication mechanism. It's not RFC 4017 compliant, so it doesn't do all the things that we know to be a secure authentication mechanism. There's no support for encryption key delivery, so you really don't see EAP MD5 used too much. Uh, I'm told that it's used very popularly by large wireless ISPs in Korea. Haven't been out there to check it out yet. Uh, and then recently I've been to a bunch of customers who would tell me they use EAP MD5 on their wired networks as well, which is kind of interesting. Uh, there's no native supplicant support in Windows, uh, but you can get an alternative uh, supplicant in OSX or uh, Odyssey. So OSX natively supports EPMD5, uh, Odyssey supports EPMD5 as well. The server support is Windows IAS, Cisco ECS, Steel Belted Radius, and Free Radius. What's interesting is that IAS and Free Radius have EPMD5 enabled by default. So when you install Windows IAS, it does uh, PEEP by default and it does EPMD5 by default as well. Now, I don't really know why this is. I don't know why Microsoft includes EPMD5 support in Windows IAS when the supplicant doesn't support that, but it stands to reason that if somebody wanted to, like an OSX user wanted to use it, they could just pick EPMD5 and successfully authenticate against your IAS server in a default configuration, which could leave your network a little bit exposed. So an interesting thing there and it's, and it's just on by default. Oh, awesome. Okay. So it's on for voice over IP phones. Sweet. Okay. <laughs> if, you, uh, if you have some packet captures, I'd you know, love to see that action. Okay. Uh, about where any packet captures, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm all over that. Just don't um, hex or my Wireshark implementation. You know what really sucks when you're fuzzing something and then Wireshark crashes? That's when you know that you found a problem, right? That's not cool, man. No, I don't like that. I, I, you know, I want Wireshark not to crash, really. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, so what does the EPMD5 exchange look like? We got our 802.11 authentication and association stuff, and uh, I'm still not authenticated to the network, I'm just authenticated to the AP, and now I'm going to do some identity request and response stuff. Basically, I'm brokering back and forth between the radio server. The radio server generates a 16 by MD5 challenge and sends it to me. And then I use, uh, as my client, I calculate my response ID, my password, and my challenge, concatenate it together, and I MD5 that, and that's my response. So it's just a simple MD5 challenge response mechanism for E5. This all goes in plain text. So uh, this has been a problem, right? Anybody looking at this says, well, you know, this is, this is kind of broken here, right? This isn't cool. So uh, this, this has been around for a while now, but nobody had written an exploit tool, so I decided to go to town on that. So I wrote a tool called EPMD5 Pass, and, and I'll tell you about where all this stuff will be at the end of the presentation. Uh, so EPMD5 Pass, you know, uh, pretty straightforward. Reads in a PCAP file, reads in a dictionary file. Uh, on my, uh, you know, uh, uh, piece of crap laptop, I'm doing like 400,000 passwords a second. That's pretty unoptimized. I think in any modern system, you'll be doing like well over a million a second. So, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty effective at doing these offline dictionary attacks. Tool didn't exist, so I took it upon myself to write it. Okay, uh, what about Leap? Yeah, all right, yeah, 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 and it's GPO, woo-hoo, yeah, free beer, woo, all right, uh, 
<laughs> so uh, what about Leap, right? Uh, Leap uh, has been broken for a couple of years now. I think a lot of people realize that. Uh, I see less and less Leap, but um, quite honestly, I don't get out of the house that much, right? Uh, so uh, people tell me there's a lot of Leap still. I don't really understand that. It uses uh, MS Chat V1 for authentication. Now, unlike Landman, like the legacy MS Chat V1 stuff, it does actually protect uh, your passwords a little bit better. So it doesn't convert all the passwords to uppercase. It doesn't split them into seven byte chunks and all that stuff that Landman used to do. But it still does the traditional MS Chat V1 challenge response mechanism, where uh, the uh, authentication agent sends an eight byte challenge, the uh, client sends a 24 byte response, and, and that gets validated. Okay. So again, this is only available on Cisco AP. So a couple years ago, I wrote a sleep to do this uh, attack, and, and uh, it also works against PPTP networks as well. So this is old news. Uh, the new thing is that uh, in a sleep, I added support to specify a challenge and a response right on the command line. Uh, you know, I, I like writing C. I don't like writing packet parsers uh, personally. So uh, what I did was uh, JBL actually called me up. Yeah, JBL, you. Yeah! Dude, that was all right, crazy. All right, yeah. All right, all right. Uh, so JBL called me up and he said, "Hey, we'd really like this feature where uh, I have a MS Chat V1 challenge response. It's not in a packet capture format that Asleep understands. Can I just give you the challenge response?" And I'm like, "Yeah, man." So that night, right after dinner, it took me like 15 minutes. So now with the Sleep, you can say dash C, there's the challenge, dash R, there's a 24-byte response, here's my database file for uh, looking up all the entries, here's my index file, and, uh, you know, JBL is posse. So, uh, this is, uh, you know, traditional functionality. Basically, what's happened with the sleep is that it's gone from just leap cracking to more generic MS Chat V1 cracking, or MS Chat V2 cracking, and, and I'm going through all this because it's going to be important in a couple seconds for the good stuff. All right, uh, let's talk about eat fast for a minute. So um, when, I, uh, when I was doing the whole vulnerability thing, I'm going to go like step over here because this is better for me. Okay, uh, so uh, with eat fast, when I was talking to Cisco about disclosing the whole leap vulnerability thing, they said, uh, well, we need like uh, six months to fix this. All right, six months went by. We need another three months. All right, three months went by. We need another month. Okay, the next day they came out with eat fast which is the replacement to do leap. And basically Cisco's pitch is, it's as secure as peep, but as simple as leap. Yeah, all right, man, I'm all over that, okay? So, uh, yeah, thanks, Brad. Uh, so it uses uh, a pre-shared authentication credential. I don't, did I fix that? That might not be right. No, no, no. No, that's yeah. not right? <laughs> what is it? Oh, protected, protected, yeah, protected, protected authentication yeah. credential. Yeah, something, all right. It's basically a file-based authentication mechanism. How do you get that pack? Right? H how do you get that pack? You just, you know, the, the administrator emails it to you, right? And you get it. No, no, no. They put it on a thumb drive and they walk into your machine. No, 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 that's not going to work as well. So what do we do with that? Well, they've got an anonymous EAP pack provisioning mechanism where basically you first log on to the EAPFAST access point and you say, hey, I don't want the pack. And it uses anonymous Diffie-Hellman negotiation, which translates to no negotiation. And then it says, hey, here's your pack. Okay? You do EPMSHET v2 authentication with whoever the access point says he is, and then they give you a pack. Okay? And then you disconnect and you use that pack and you authenticate to the network. Okay? So that's something called EPFAST phase zero provisioning, and it's how they actually deploy these packs. Cisco's recommendation is to use this thing, you should initially set up all your clients with EPFAST phase zero turned on, and then once all your clients are provisioned, you turn that off. Okay, that, that works. And then what happens when you add one more client? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You turn it back on, and then you never shut it off again, which is seen consistently in every deployment I've ever seen. Okay? So uh, this is kind of a not cool thing. So uh, you know, they do have some additional features here uh, where uh, they do have the ability to do eat fast pack provisioning using uh, RSA-based authentication, where you would have to visit the client install a new digital certificate, and then use that to authenticate the access point to do uh, the eat fast pack provisioning in a secure manner. Uh, that doesn't really work, right? Why am I going to visit the client, install an RSA certificate, and then use it to automatically provision a certificate? It's Cisco's like circular logic thing, and, and I love this. They've got this logic thing where, so, well, I need, I need secure pack provisioning. 
Okay? Well, that's why we have this RSA-based mechanism. But, but I need to be simple. I don't want to touch any machines. Well, that's why we have anonymous fast provisioning. But, but I need to be secure. Well, that's why we have the RSA thing, right? So and it just, it's a circular logic thing where you can't really get around that stuff. So it's kind of a problem. Uh, we unfortunately don't have an attack demonstration.